I am, as the VP for Diversity Initiatives, I'm particularly excited that in this first year of the, of the 3G initiative, that we actually have an Excellence in Diversity Award um, that has been established. Uh, we consider it to be very prestigious and very important uh, to the recipient of this award. Um, I will tell you that our selection committee uh, met this morning. We have got three exceptional uh, nominations for the award and the selection will be made and the award will be presented in Adelaide in September. So we're, we're really thrilled about that. So um, for, for today's luncheon, I first, of course, want to mention that the luncheon is, is being sponsored today by ESA. And surprisingly, um, we have a very important speaker today, um, Professor Jan Werner. Now I know why I wasn't right there. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and, and um, uh, of, of particular importance, um, Professor Werner, uh, I believe, is going to speak on ESA's Young Professionals Program or, or can at least uh, share a little bit about, about what that is. And, of course, Professor Werner is the S uh, Director General of ESA. So, with that, I would like to turn, turn the stage over to you. Thank you very much. I will remain here because you should not look to me, but you should look to the presentation, which I prepared. Uh, thank you very much again. And uh, I would like to say a few words not about ESA in this room, uh, but more about general topics, about what is really the generation diversity, what is it about, and why are we doing it, what is the advantage, and what are also things we have to consider. So, of course, what we are doing is say all of us is here, but so this is the foundation of what we are doing. We are tackling what is called the global challenges, but there are, the, beyond these very concrete challenges, there is something which I call, of course, as you call it, curiosity, which also is progress. And all of this is very important. I don't know, three hands, okay, I will manage it. So, uh, but the mic does not work, so now it's working. Is it really better for you? Okay, if it's better for you, it's better for me, but uh, anyhow. So, um, and diversity, as we heard this morning, we will have it also uh, this evening, diversity is a diverse action already because it has these different dimensions. Uh, we heard this morning about not only the 3Gs, 4Gs, 5Gs, even some more Gs. Uh, so, um, this diverges, uh, the, the diversity in the different areas um, is important, so I should talk about the diversity with respect to generations. And then we have to look to generations. And here you see the distribution of age across the world. Okay, there is some distribution. But this is just the world. Now, uh, let's have a view to the American, uh, to the United States of America. It's a totally different picture, uh, which shows that also, yes, there is maybe you are in a comfortable situation in the US because it's more or less homogeneously distributed over a long period. Now, if we look to Europe, it looks like this, uh, and therefore we come also to a situation, and if you know this, this is moving up, so we have a very special uh, topic and subject really to, um, to combine the different possibilities, and therefore we have these special programs which were mentioned already. So there is, uh, if you look into this field of uh, generations, then you come immediately up to the question of intelligence uh, and uh, how smart are people. I will not bother you with all the details of this, but this is uh, as the, the developments of different personal capabilities with age. Uh, so there is uh, social emotional, which is increasing, not for all people, but for several. So sensorial, motoric, knowledge, and so on. I make it a little bit simpler, and this is this picture. So it is called the so-called crystallized and the fluid. Um, intelligence. In crystallized intelligence is something which you learn, which you keep in you. So it's uh, the heritage of your, your own. So it's uh, tradition, it is experience, it is knowledge about something. And the other one is a fluid um, intelligence. 
and this is uh, the ability really to think about new things, to really be disruptive, etc., without having the basis of the knowledge. So, and if you look into this picture, of course, we have a problem. Uh, we have the problem that the older the you get, of course, experience is a very nice tool, but unfortunately, your fluid intelligence is reduced. Uh, everybody in my age knows it. Uh, so, ladies in the room are all, all too young. They are always over here, so therefore, they don't know about what I'm talking. Uh, so, the other thing is, of course, we are looking back to experience and all of this. Now, if we look into this now, uh, into the um, uh, diversity aspect, then the idea is of generation diversity. Okay, we take somebody who is over here, a young one, um, and we are taking, of course, his personal capabilities of fluid intelligence, and we combine it directly with somebody of, uh, with an, uh, uh, who is older with his crystallized um, intelligence. And by adding those two up, we suddenly come up in a much better position. So therefore, this is more or less the secret of generation diversity, taking the different possibilities of young and older people and combine them. So this is therefore not just something which is uh, from a social responsibility necessary to keep uh, old people and young people in the game, but it's also for the sake of the institution and the area as a whole. And there's another thing, and this is something about motivation. Um, and this is where space can play an important role. If I'm talking about motivation, I'm talking about the current motivation of people to work for our society, not only for space, but in general terms. So, so what is the motivation of people? Where does it come from? If you look around and if you see all the different aspects of uh, economic crisis, of climate change, and maybe of terror attacks, then of course the motivation goes down. So the individual may not be ready to invest time and efforts to get a better job, to get a better education, because the situation is so frustrating that why should I go to university? Why should I learn something? if the world is so bad that it will be the end anyhow. So therefore, these are aspects, you could have even more, which are, which are really reducing motivation. On the other hand, we have space. And space with its various activities is inspiring, is fascinating. I mean, this was during the Apollo uh, time, but it's also today, if we look, for instance, to the Rosetta mission, which was really inspiring people. Uh, and so we need these great ideas also in space in order to inspire people because you have a return of investment not directly in in uh, money but you have a return of investment so, so for the society so by using space to motivate people not only in space but in general terms to work for the society gives an additional value for all of us and therefore um, it's also this sentence i think from yoko ono you know her it's very clear some people are old at 18 and some are young at 90. Time is a concept that humans created, so therefore this should be the basis of working together with uh, different ages. This is a picture without words, uh, which I found when I prepared this presentation. I think it's a very nice one. It shows really that time is changing also. My, I mean, I'm more, more this type right now. I'm not so happy my son and my daughters are not this type, so they are not... <laughs> This might be the future, but uh, again, so we are in a changing world and this is also a, an opportunity for uh, space. So, of course, we are discussing about diversity. I do not have to repeat all of this because you are here because you are in favor of diversity. At least I uh, expect, um, I believe that. So there are very different types of activities which are in the diversity scheme really supporting four different aspects within an institution but also within a society as a whole. And therefore, if we are looking towards uh, what is coming up in future with space, I, for sure, we need um, also the diversity of generations uh, as uh, support because there are a lot of different things. This is looked from a European perspective, but if you just erase the first one, then maybe you can also agree with all the other ones. So global political developments, we don't know what is happening, so we better prepare ourselves. Global challenges, societal developments. 
the market developments, commercialization, some call it new space, I don't call it new space because it's an old story, but anyhow, uh, space defense, space security, space tourism, planetary defense, and then even uh, more interesting things over here, disruptive discoveries. What if we found, if we understand what um, dark matter and dark energy is? What, how will that have an impact on what we are thinking today and maybe even also on, uh, on the position of technology. So therefore all of these are developments and uh, impacting factors and we better take care of them and some of them can be taken into a consideration by really, um, as I said, by um, experience, by knowledge and some others might be necessary. We need uh, also new uh, ideas, totally disruptive ideas and by combining them we can really have a better solution. So space as an enabler for diversity, we are discussing about this. Yes, with academia, industry and agencies, uh, their space can be an enabler for diversity also in the society because we discussed it this morning at especially at my table we had these three subjects and it's clear that uh, due to the different um, purposes of uh, using diversity we can do something for the society. Space is also an enabler of diversity on a, through global peaceful cooperation if we are working together between different countries worldwide and because also because of the different positions of generations um, diversity is supported through space and then STEM science technology engineering and math and I added the A so we come to STEAM and with A I mean all the other areas and therefore I say arts but it should be cultural activities etc being over there so space can also uh, support diversity in this field science and development, pioneering exploration and of course always my four eyes information, innovation, interaction, inspiration. But we can turn it also the other way around. Diver diversity is an enabler for space, optimal use of capabilities, new disruptive ideas, synergies between different uh, uh, thinking, also the team building um, is better if you have also diversity and I'm, I'm here talking only about uh, diversity of generations and of course also the outreach into the society um, therefore diversity is also an enabler for space because if uh, people in space um, different ages uh, different gender are uh, talking about space then this is also a supporter for space and again information innovation interaction inspiration so all together what is uh, my final conclusion? Space is a role model for diversity. Thank you very much for your attention. In fact, I forget one thing, this one. I wanted to put this one in addition because this is also a message, uh, especially for people in my age, that we so should uh, trust younger people to have new ideas, to think out of the box. Um, and this is, uh, we should not play the role like this one which we found uh, usually in our organizations. My team is having trouble thinking outside the box. We can't agree on the size of the box, what materials the box should be constructed from, a reasonable budget for the box, our first choice of box vendor. So now, but that is now really the end. Thank you very much. Let me start with a reflection on how are we preparing ourselves to uh, be working in the 4.0 world. Uh, we know that there are three essential factors that are shaping the organization of the work and the competences that will be needed. One is globalization, the demographic developments, but also the technical change. We know that digitization will be, it will encompasses big data, the raise of internet platforms. Uh, internet is penetrating in each sectors of the economy, artificial intelligence, so this is also taking, uh, I mean, is a tsunami that is really progressing at the speed, an exponential speed. And so we know from, uh, from the economist that a significant uh, part of the jobs that will be required in the future will uh, probably uh, not be needed and uh, will be have an intensity of 
automation. And uh, uh, some economists also consider that in the next 20 years, in the US, about 47% of the jobs existing today will not be any longer needed. So what does it mean? Um, what the OECD explains, and this is a, a very interesting debate, is that the results of this transformation will be essentially a polarization of the tasks that will be needed in the future. On the lower uh, side of the spectrum, we will have tasks that require low uh, imagination, like long-term care or uh, security. But on the other side, we will have uh, an increasing demand for creativity and for all those skills that in the past were maybe called soft, but they'll become more and more part of the professional uh, uh, requirements and skills. So the first things, given that we are uh, discussing this in a, in a generation uh, diversity, is how we get the skills right. Uh, first of all, it's clear that the technical part will still remain uh, a very important part. But uh, we know that in just three years, one third of the competences that will be considered key for jobs, we are not yet uh, considered or crucial today. So in four years, we will have really a revolution of uh, what will be required. And in particular, social skills, which means emotional intelligence, persuasions, cognitive skills, meaning critical thinking and uh, mathematical thinking, but also process things, the ability to think differently. So uh, this is, uh, uh, so you see that already today there is a big mismatch about qualification and jobs, and this will increase, meaning that you can have a major in music and still be an economist tomorrow, and this is increasingly uh, a reality, in particular in the US. Now, the future of work, the future of you. Uh, the first things that we have to change uh, is how we, uh, approach also, I mean, within our value, the concept of success and the concept of failure. Based on, uh, on an article on nature, this Princeton professor, professor made a CV of failures. Actually, he listed all the things that he didn't work for him, all the position that he couldn't get, as this is becoming uh, an increasing element of uh, understanding the personalities through uh, the risk that has been taken. We know, for instance, that in NASA, only 15 years ago, the motto was, uh, failure is not an option. This was in the wake of the Columbia accident. But today, the motto of NASA, we heard this from Bolden, is fail early, fail smart. So failure is really becoming high in terms of uh, um, indicators of the abilities to take risks and to be uh, innovative. Uh, the other important thing is counter thinking, as also Jan was saying. Peter Thiel, who is a co founder, was co founder of PayPal with Elon Musk, always says that uh, when he interviews young people, he asks a question very simple, straightforward w Can you tell me something where you, that you really believe in and no one else agrees with you on that? This question actually has a twofold uh, value. On one side, uh, the fact that we all, uh, in a way, uh, our knowledge is based on a shared knowledge means that it's anyway very difficult to, to have a different standpoint and, uh, uh, and a different point of view on things that are more or less part of our common knowledge. But because of this, you know that by saying something disruptive, you will become popular. You are risking also to lose consensus. So uh, the, the, the importance of this counter thinking is related to the fact that only through this, you can be closer to the future. Only by, see, by going from zero to one, you can really make a difference. And if disruptive ideas are rare, the courage to embrace it a river rarer. And this is something that is going to change, is, is slowly going to change. And this part also of, of a message we have. 
The other thing is uh, do not take a no for answer. There will be always the old generation, uh, a part of the old generation that will uh, say this is impossible, uh, this is will never work. So this intergenerational diversity will also have to mix this ability to dare, this ability to dream with the idea no, uh, this is will never uh, go through and will never be accomplished. So my message, I always uh, try also to say this to young people, it is that don't never take a no for an answer and don't be afraid to dare because it's only by trying to do something that is uh, bold, is not easy, you will bring a change with you. So. Uh, this is a, a very nice sentence from Thomas Eliot, do I dare to decide the universe, and the picture is beautiful. Now, this is uh, in particular applicable to girls. Uh, this morning also we had a breakfast that for girls is even more difficult to dare. And this is also in part due to the fact, and I will, uh, I will uh, uh, show the statement that was made this morning by Jan, is that uh, um, girls, ladies, women, feels that uh, uh, they have to meet 100% of the requirement before applying. Now, this is also will, and is part of a change that is visible in some countries, competences, as uh, uh, described in, uh, in vacancy notice, are less and less just on the technical side. For instance, you have to run 100 meters in 10 seconds. So you only do it in 12 seconds, you don't apply. Uh, the revision of competence as being larger and including many more aspects than just the uh, super technical one is a process that is ongoing and will highly benefit uh, in uh, candidature from women in the future. Now, I want to conclude with something that I hope will work. I strongly believe that diversity is a call for fairness. Uh, diversity means that no one is uh, left behind and there will be uh, a welcoming space for everyone. And this morning we, uh, we can you just stop? I will, uh, yes. yeah. So I will show you, we, we spoke this morning about how much our brain is wired with, uh, with uh, stereotypes, with prejudgments. But if we see the reaction to unfairness, is the only feeling where the survival part of our brains get really in conflict with principles. Uh, meaning that you are even ready to die, but you cannot accept an unfair situation. So we show you this experiment. So the, uh, they learn that by giving a token, they get something to eat. So the monkey gets cucumber and she's happy. Then the others gives the token and she gets in exchange grape. So the first one sees that and he doesn't like that. So he gives the token, he gets again cucumber and look at the reaction. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and this is, <laughs> I think it's a strong message in, in this sense. I, mean, I think we can stop because it gets crazy, really crazy in the video. <laughs> uh, the message is, uh, uh, and this is uh, an intergenerational uh, uh, issue, uh, we have to uh, work for really having a, a fair inclusion as an objective. Uh, this is the only situation and environment that will bring anyone to provide the best of his effort and really leverage on what everyone can, can bring to a successful endeavor. So thank you very much. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm also working at ESA and I'm here to tell you that uh, diversity is already a reality at ESA and I'm here to share with you the experience of a 3G department at ESA. So my name is Geraldine Naja. I'm the head of the Industrial Policy and Auditing Department, and I'm really happy to present you this example that yes, uh, diversity is a reality already. Diversity, we talk gender. So the Industrial Policy and Audit Department, which I have the pleasure and honor to, to chair, uh, has uh, 38 people. And guess what? 19 men 
19 women. So we can't do much better than that. On top, uh, I must say, it is headed by a woman. Uh, and there we see already some considerable progress because I have been at ESA for uh, quite some time. When I started at ESA, there was one woman head of department. Now there are five, so 500% increase. There was no woman director. Now there is one. So. so you see already considerable progress. Certainly we can still improve, but already there has been some progress. So gender, uh, in my department, we are exactly at 50-50. Geography. Geography, I said already, we are 38 people. And we have, I counted, 14 nationalities represented in these 38 people. So it's quite a, a good selection of nationalities of our 22 member states. And on top of that, my department is spread between Paris, the headquarters of the European Space Agency, and ESTEC, that is in Nordwijk, in the Netherlands, the technical center of the agency. So we are geographical, I would say, in both senses, sites and nationalities. And I must say, this is an incredible wealth because, of course, there are cultural differences, there are different ways of working, but it's so amazing to work with 14 different nationalities. And the third G is generation, and that's what I will address a little bit further on. Generation, yes, I have, uh, 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 let's say, a wealth of generations. Uh, I have people starting in their uh, late 20s uh, until uh, my... Uh, senior uh, member of department uh, who is there and who is 65, I think I, it's allowable to say it. And all this represents three successive work generations. Uh, I will come to that. I would even add, uh, we can say a 4G department because my name is Geraldine, but uh, okay. This being said, what I want to say is that this diversity for all of us is an incredible experience and it's really a fantastic place to work at. G like generation. You know that in the work uh, world, we have now considering that there are four, well, three generations which are currently on the, on the work. The baby boomers who are born after the war, just after the war, 45 until more or less 64. Then we have generation X. Uh, starting 64, 65 until 80, and the famous millennials, the Generation Y, which are born after 1980. I have made the statistics to prepare this uh, speech. I have currently 12 baby boomers. I have 15 Generation X and nine Generation Y. And I happen to be the little blue cross here. Uh, so I'm, I'm right in the middle between baby boomers and Generation X. So it's a, it's a very nice place to be. It also gives me the experience of the different ways of working. When I started at ESA, I was the beginning of the Generation X. Now I'm the very end, but it's a very interesting experience. And uh, I would like to say, in addition to that, that uh, most of my baby boomers will be retiring in the next three years or so. So uh, the department will undergo a significant rejuvenation, uh, and in particular the heads of division. So this will certainly change the way we are working. And I would like to address briefly with you what are the challenges associated to these three different generations at work? Clearly, the management methods. Yes, when I started at ESA and when I, my first bosses were, I would not even say baby boomers, they were even sometimes earlier than the baby boom, the management was clearly top down. The boss has talked, everyone shuts up. Uh, this has changed and you cannot manage a team anymore like that. You have to talk, you have to discuss, you have to exchange. Also, I would say we're almost in a neuronal way of management because we have to uh, uh, take into account the views of all the people of the department. In the end, certainly you have to decide, but you cannot decide like you used to decide before. Ways of working. Ways of working, clearly, flexibility is the main word. We have now, thanks to the digital word, the possibility to work in a completely different manner. When I started working, there was almost no computers, 
almost. Uh, at least there was no internet, there was no mail, uh, you know, all these things didn't exist. So you had your day at work. Normally you would stay very late because that's how you meant, you were meant to prove that you were a hard worker. You would stay very late at work. And then when you were home, you couldn't work anymore, more or less. You could still read a few documents, but you, you couldn't really exchange. The younger generations, there is no such separation. You work also during the weekend, you work also at night, but it means also that if you have an issue with maybe a child or maybe a family issue or whatever, you leave work at four or five, you address it and then you continue working. My, I must say myself, I'm the mother of two teenage daughters. I appreciate this flexibility. And in my team, I have had men and women together, seven babies in the last two years. I tell you, the young parents are quite happy also of this flexibility. If you want a young, a rejuvenated workplace, you have to take this into account. And I think this flexibility is fantastic for everyone. Uh, it means, of course, no meeting after 6 p.m. if you can avoid it. It means that you limit the traveling, you do more video conf, you do more WebEx, but all this works very well when you know each other. So that's certainly not an issue. Communication, information sharing. It means that, yes, the younger generations, they email, they text. They don't phone, they don't write. But it also, more importantly, means that information is not something that you keep. It's not a wealth or a, uh, a bag of gold that you do not share. It's something that has only value if you share it. And for the younger generations, it's an obvious fact. And we have now the digital agenda for space at ESA, which means that ESA will enter the digital world and that there is a complete paradigm shift is information is shared a priori. And if you don't share it, you have to say why. Clearly, when I started working, you had to justify why you would share the info. So it's, it's a complete difference. I would al also add that in this communication information sharing, there is more importance also granted to the informal way of communicating, more need for celebrating successes of the team, more need for informal get-togethers. So it, all this has completely changed the way we work. And finally, uh, managing the retirement wave. You may have heard that th at ESA, and I'm sure we're not the only place like that, more or less 50% of the staff will retire in the next 10 to 12 years, I think. You can imagine the change it's going to bring to ESA. Right now, the average age at ESA is 49, which is quite old. But you imagine that in the next 10 years, this age will drop significantly. So all that I'm explaining to you today will be even more significant in 10 years from now. But that means also that we have to make sure that this wave takes place properly. An expert like Peter, who has amassed a wealth of knowledge and expertise. We cannot let him go without making sure that he has transferred to his successor, to the whole team, all the expertise that he has gathered over his long career. So there is a process to be set up. We are also thinking of setting up mentoring, coaching to help these millennials get into the workplace and, and make sure that we do not lose this expertise and this experience. So you see, I think already ESA is a diverse place. I'm sure it will even be better in the future, but there are so many opportunities. I can only welcome you and say ESA is a great place to work at. Thank you. Hi, hello. So my name is Kate Underhill. I'm also working at ESA like all the other presenta presenters today. And I'm a propulsion engineer in the Future Launch Rate Preparatory Department. But today I'm going to talk to you about a survey that I have uh, helped to organize and perform on young professional decision factors within aerospace. Yes, <laughs> thank you, very good. So um, first of all, so this is a generational issue. Um, what, what are the decision factors for young professionals within aerospace? And this grew out of participating in the Young Professional Workshop of the uh, IPMC, the IAC IPMC Committee in uh, Jerusalem in 2015. I was selected by ESA Human Resources 
to participate. I was a group lead of group two, and we had to look into quantifying decision factors for aerospace young professionals. But quantification, you need numbers. You need quantities to look at, so we decided to look into performing a survey. But we didn't have enough time to do a full survey, so we looked into the existing information, we prepared a field test survey, and we tried it out. And we presented our results, and our result was, we should try and do this for real. And that's what we did after 2015 workshop with the support of the IPMC committee and with the support of ESA Human Resources. We made out the full survey and we distributed it last year uh, using the White Young Professional Networks. And I'm going to present just uh, some of the results today. So uh, we got 359 responses of our survey, 62% male, 37% female. You can see the age distribution. Geographical distribution, so lots of Europeans, but a decent amount of people coming from the Americas as well. Uh, and a career status. And just to say, within the survey, we actually set up kind of different question strands based on three different criteria. Whether someone was an aerospace student, whether they were what we considered to be newly graduated, that is to say less than two years experience, otherwise a young professional. Technically, I think a young professional for the uh, IPMC is under 36, under 30, well, 35 and under. There we go. Anyway, that's technically a young professional for us. Next slide. Millennium. Millennium. So for aerospace students category, so we didn't get a huge amount of responses for this one, 27 replies, but still have some interesting kind of takeaways from it. You can see people come interested very early, nearly 50% before 10 years old, 84% before they're 20. Obviously people before they go to university, they're interested in aerospace. And that comes from astronauts, that comes from presentations of, of space programs, but also comes from a link in with flying and, and pilots. So aerospace in general uh, is interesting to, to young people and also popular culture. Now you're going to see this again and again, interest in subject, challenge and excitement. They are top motivations. This is why students study aerospace and this is why young professionals work in aerospace. In terms of career information, young professionals or students, uh, they follow it, uh, aerospace organizations on social media. They're young people, they use Twitter, they use Facebook, but they still use more traditional career websites for their career information. So there's an interesting takeout. If, if we're doing good things, if we're tweeting about our young programs, then we should also link that to traditional career websites. Newly gra graduated category, so we have 47 replies, a bit better on this one, but because we're limiting the people in this category to less than two years experience, obviously the category is a bit limited. As I said, you're going to see this again and again. Interest in subject, change and excitement. That's why these people are working in aerospace. Main reasons for leaving aerospace, why they would consider not working in aerospace. Salary, location and leadership opportunities. Career information on the internet. And this is linked. Location is a reason why they might leave. Location, aerospace is poorly rated for location, as well as work-life balance and flexible schedule compared to non-aerospace sectors. Now, if we look on the next slide, this is a comparison of pro career progression between young, new graduates and young professionals. And in fact, even though we had the three different kind of question sections, we asked quite often the same question to the different groups and then we could compare the answers. Now, here were six categories. We asked people, how often do you expect a pay rise? How often do you expect a promotion? How often do you expect to change companies? And you can see most of them are happening this is a kind of a normalized how often they think it's going to happen. Most things happen every one to five years. Uh, for example, new responsibilities, they expect that to happen a bit earlier. And what is very clear, 35% uh, of young professionals said they expected never to change careers. They're definitely very interested in staying in aerospace. But what is interesting point here is even though new graduates and young professionals have the same shape of career aspirations, you can see that new graduates expect things to happen a little bit quicker than young professionals. And in fact, as I said, so young professionals, 35% said they would never change careers. 4% also said they would never get promotion, which is a little bit sad. So is it young professionals, are they becoming more realistic or are they becoming pessimistic about their career progression? So out of the young professional category, it's the biggest category. We had 285 replies with a, a different variety of experience. Again, it's exactly the same three each time. Why are you working in aerospace? Interest in the subject, challenge and excitement. As I've said before, people are very likely to stay in aerospace. They like working in aerospace. However, salary, location and work-life balance are reasons why they might leave aerospace. 
Salary is an interesting one, and we saw this before already in our, on our field test survey. People say salary is an issue, but then we try and ask them, compare it to uh, amount of work or change of work. You can see it's very nuanced. People say salary is a reason for leaving aerospace. Also, people who don't work in aerospace say it's a reason why they would want to come back to work for aerospace. 43% of respondents were happy with the salary they have, and aerospace is judged similar or positively to non-aerospace careers for salary. So we have to look into this further. It's not just about salary. People would sometimes prefer a change in their work or a little modification in the amount of work they have than a salary change. And I keep saying again, location keeps coming back as an issue across all categories. Uh, physically, the sites working on aerospace were physically limited with the sites. But as Geraldine has said, in today's modern world, we have different tools for working. We don't always need to be physically in one place to work correctly. And another interesting point, work-life balance. So on the previous slide, it was leadership that was the third point for new graduates. It's become now it's work-life balance is a reason that young professionals, so people with a bit more experience, think of reason at leaving aerospace. And one point, another, another point we came from the survey is we took some lessons learned from the survey, questions that worked, questions that didn't work. And one of the things we realized we didn't include in one of the options about what job are you doing is a startup. And a number of people left comments saying, there is no opportunity for me to work in aerospace where I am, so I created my own company. I made my own startup. And that's a very interesting point. Again, locations are limited. Sometimes jobs are limited. So young people get around that by making their own startup. This one I really like. This is like the reality check. So as I've said before, we are again quite sneaky. We also asked aerospace young graduates, young professionals, question, why did you choose to work in aerospace? And later on we asked them, what is your current satisfaction with your career? And we gave them exactly the same possible responses. And this is where we get this reality check. Again, interest in subject, change and excitement are the reasons why people choose to work in aerospace. It's not why they're satisfied to work in aerospace today. And it's kind of obvious that would happen for any job. You know, people, jobs you have boring but important things to do in jobs. But maybe aerospace suffers from it a bit more because of the people who are wanting, the dreamers, the people who are excited about new technologies coming to work here. And the other interesting point is these unplanned satisfactions. When you're choosing a job when you're 20, 25, you don't really think about maybe work environment or culture or work-life balance. But after 10 years in your career, they suddenly become much more important. And you can see that work-life balance is a huge unplanned satisfaction for young professionals. They are satisfied with their work-life balance in general compared to what they were considering when they entered the career. Uh, what again is interesting with this is so I, essentially it was a generational question. What do aerospace young professionals think? Why are they choosing to make the decisions they make? But because of the way we set up the survey, we could also compare the other Gs. So we could compare the responses of males and females. We could compare the responses between different geographical areas. Uh, and so the, here I just present some of the kind of quick takeouts between these comparisons. Lifestyle reasons are more cited as potential reason to leave aerospace by women. But that's an effect. What is the cause? Is it more important to women or is it just that the lifestyle doesn't suit them when they're working in aerospace? North America, Western Europe, uh, salary and benefits. Benefits are a huge issue for North Americans. They're not, Europeans don't even worry about it. They've got, they have their benefits. They have their health insurance covered. Uh, another interesting one is experience. We could also compare people who had, so young professionals with less than five experience and young professionals with more than five years experience. And it's young professionals, young ones, they're focused on the interest in their job. They're focused on how much they can learn. They're, they're hungry to keep learning. Older young professionals, it's, it's again, lifestyle, good working conditions, work-life balance, and recognition. And if you remember that slide previously where I compared uh, even further up. Again, again, again. That one, sorry. I do this again. I do this again for the comparing young professionals with less than five years' experience, more than five years' experience. Exactly the same, same thing happens. The more experience you have, the lower your expectations go about how often things are going to happen. Uh, and the last one, non-technical and technical young professionals. So culture of the company and work environment is in general more important to those working in non-technical jobs. And they're a little bit less uh, likely to be loyal to aerospace. They're not in aerospace for the, for the interest in the subject. They're there because it's a nice place to work. So just to sum up, uh, this is a survey we performed from the with the IPMC committee 
Uh, we've written a re I've written a report analyzing the results. We've also had these kind of takeouts from the survey. It was very hard for us to get a high response rate. We had a bit of problem getting into aerospace students. So if you wanted to continue it, we should think about things like that. And based on this quantitative information, this is what the data has said, we have this report with 20 recommendations. I've already talked about some of these points. Like I say, link social media updates to actual careers websites because that's going to get more traffic in that way. And propose flexible working schemes to enable professionals to work in other locations. We don't need to be fixed in one office or one location now. We can have, we can use the tools we have today and that would really uh, help young professionals to, 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 to enter into and stay into the industry. Thank you very much. I just want to thank um, our uh, presenters and um, our Director General, uh, Jan Werner, for coming here, even though you had to be here because we're sponsoring it. Um, <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed it. There are just, um, before everyone goes, I'm very happy that um, Cecilia, Geraldine, and Kate uh, were willing to present and um, just to shine the light on them and their successes in the career. Um, Cecilia has been with the agency for uh, quite some time, since 1991. She's been in various directorates and um, um, heads of um, um, departments positions. Um, she's been in policy and strategy, international relations, coordination and exploration activities, uh, support to the decision making with member states. She spent uh, time in, in the Washington office um, and she was a member of the Board of Directors for Women in Aerospace while in the US. It shows that uh, within ESA, the diverse career that she's managed is very impressive. And um, she is now appointed the new uh, Chief Diversity Officer. So um, I think we will be looking very closely to what she has for us in the future. Um, Geraldine Naya, uh, Naja, she's my manager, my boss boss, uh, so to say. So I'm very happy to be working for her and uh, being part of the diverse um, 4G um, IPL directorate. Uh, um, also, she's uh, joined the agency in 1987. Um, she's had an impressive career. She's been head of uh, the um, industrial policy and audit department since April 2015. She's one of very few women as head of department. Um, she has moved uh, through corporate and uh, programmatic functions as head of long-term space policy office, head of EU relations office, senior advisor to the director of launchers for institutional matters. And she's been seconded to the French uh, Ministry of Research as an advisor to the minister. Um, she said herself her most challenging job is her two teenage daughters. Um, but um, <laughs> I'll be making sure to come for advice to you. Um, then Kate, um, she first joined ESA in 2007 as a YGT, the Young uh, Graduate Trainee Program, uh, spending one or two years at ESA before moving on to um, CNES, Ariane Space, Space um, MT Aerospace, and then coming back to ESA in 2014 as a propulsion engineer. So it shows that um, even though um, sometimes people leave after they've received the opportunity to um, participate to a trainee program within ESA. They gain their experience in industry elsewhere and then they come back and um, we're very happy with Kate doing other things than just her engineering work by, for instance, the, um, the survey. Um, then this topic is generation and this is just... Um, summary of all the opportunities that ESA is uh, presenting to uh, younger generations. Um, the YGT, the Young Graduate Trainee Program, uh, the National Trainee, um, ESA Space Camp, PhDs and, and postdocs, um, trainings, workshops. Um, we have um, an ESA Kids um, and internship. There are so many things that ESA is willing to help the next generation. And um, there are always more applicants than positions, but um, um, I want to highlight um, three of them. The Young Graduate Trainee Program, which is one or two years. Um, it is very, we have currently dozens of, of YGTs within ESA um, uh, getting their experience within the agency. Then we have um, an official body which is called uh, Young ESA, where all the young people, young at heart people within uh, ESA are um, joined together and um, we are organizing 
uh, trips to other establishments. We have uh, interviews. Uh, the DG has spoken to us many times. Uh, we organize things to um, other industries. Um, they're now proposing something to go to CERN. Or it is a platform where to get together, um, enjoy the network, and uh, share information and experiences. And then the ESA space camp uh, for children to um, start the introduction into space. There is a lot of, uh, like Kate said, we need to reach out for the younger generation even before they become professionals. And Space Kids is uh, one of those opportunities. You can find all the information on the ESA programs on uh, the internet. In worst case, you can email me. Um, I will try to help with whatever question, remarks, or uh, request you have. Um, thank you very much.